Yeah, welcome back to Think Tech. I'm Jay Fidel. This is Movies You Can Learn From. And we have a very interesting movie. It was nominated for an Oscar. And it's a movie you haven't seen before. And it's called Lunana, a yak in the classroom. How about that? Uh, George Kaysen and I are going to review that today. And it's very different from really any movie we've looked at before. Welcome, George. Thank you, Jay. Yeah, welcome. Thank you. Yeah. Why don't you uh, lay out the environment for this movie? The environment is a, is a carefully selected word. Okay. Basically, this movie is filmed in the country of Bhutan, both in the capital where this young school teacher was raised and went to school to become a teacher, and in this community called Lula, Lunana, which is way up in the Himalayas. It's in the mountains. There's no road that goes there, right? It, it's, uh, it's, you have to trek over streams and whatever. It's only uh, accessible for six months of the year when the winter comes, the snows, they're blocked in for the winter. Okay, so I'll, I'll give a little background. This young student, his parents had died when he was very young and his grandmother raised him and she wanted to get him a career that he could survive on. So she went to have him train as a teacher. He trained as a teacher. And then he signed a, a contract with the Bhutanese government to teach five years. And after the fourth year, he was really unhappy. He didn't, he didn't want to be a teacher. He was in the, in the schools in the capital, Thimphu, right? So he goes, he wants to quit, right? Break his contract. And he, he wants to go to Australia and become a singer. He's a good singer. He has his guitar, right? So he meets with a supervisor, hiring supervisor. And she's very upset with him. She says, you know, she says to him, I've never seen a, student, a, a, a teacher as unenthusiastic as you about teaching, right? And then she gives him this assignment, this the fifth year in Lunana, which is this isolated remote village. And he says, oh no, the altitude, it bothers me. And she says, no, it's your attitude. It's not an altitude problem, it's an attitude <laughs> problem. So she, you know, they speak, I mean, English is universal language all over. So they, a lot of this is in, in, the, in their local something with a D language, and a lot of it's in, in English, so you can understand, you still have subtitles. So this is basically, and then he has to go to that village. So he goes up to that village, and it's unbelievable to get there. I mean, bus, and then, and then yak, and then, and then, and then the end, they have to stay in tents to get to the village. There's, there's no place, there, there's one uh, halfway house on the way, uh, from the main, from the one of the Ganja, which is a bigger, bigger village, and then and then there's a halfway house in the middle of nowhere, and then it's all tents. So he finally gets his feet. Are, he's got regular shoes on. His feet are all wet because the shoes that the, he bought in in Thin Phu, they said, oh, it's waterproof, not waterproof when you're swimming in in in, in puddles and lakes and rivers, you know. So basically, he gets there, and immediately he tells the 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 the, the, the village head, you know, I really don't want to be here. I want to go back. But he, they needed about three days to get him back. And in that time, this young little girl, a uh, young woman, she, kid, you know, she's so brilliant. And she's a local. She's not a trained actress. She comes up to him and she says, oh, we really wanted you. We really, we were waiting for you. So he sort of has a change of heart and he decides he'll stay the winter, you know, because he, he, his, his papers for Australia haven't come through yet. Uh, so he figures he'll stay the winter. So he stays the winter and he does a good job, you know, because... I mean, he has none of the amenities he had in, in Thimphu. He has no blackboard. You can see the, the classroom is all filthy the, from the winter, you know, all the dust and everything. So he's got to clean it up and be, and he does this and he gets it. He gets some of his friends in, in, in the capital Thimphu to send him some supplies for the kids. So he becomes a good, and these kids just love him. They're totally immersed with him, right? And, and then at the end of the winter, well, you can get into a little more what happens over the different episodes. And then he finally gets to Australia. And I won't hit the say what's going, but when he gets to Australia, that's a very emphatic, profound ending to this movie. So you can fill in a little more, Jay, to this. There's, there's other players. There's this young woman. Obviously, she's got a crush on him. You know, she's a local woman. And she's a, 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 a yak herder. And, and she, she basically brings a yak to him into the classroom because the yaks are yak milk. The, 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 the yak hair, the, the yak meat, and also the dung is how they keep warm. They they fire that deck. There's nothing else that, to, to keep, you know, can't light a fire. And that's their existence up there. They're literally in symbiosis with the yak. 
The yak is their, is their survival mechanism. Without the yak, and, and they bring the yak in the classroom because they want to keep the yak warm. And then the yak's there in the classroom as, as, as he's teaching. And it, it's really symbolic, too, that, that, that the yak is so central to their existence. I mean, each of us, we think of ourselves in our per current environment, right? But we don't understand that in parts of the world, the whole environment gravitates around one animal. <laughs> And that's the yak. So I'll leave. I'll let you fill in a lot of things I, I, I'm on this, but that's the basis of this. And, and then, and then we'll get into the nitty gritty of what lessons are being taught in this movie. Profound. Okay. Yeah, that was that was a terrific uh, summary, George. I'm trying. You're really getting good at this. <laughs> My age, you know. <laughs> well, I, you know, I was. I loved this movie. I loved it because of the. The way the um, director caught the relationships between this young man and and these kids, who were a challenge for him at first, but um, he they liked him, he liked them, and they bonded up like forever. He was the best teacher they had ever had, and they all loved each other. and And, and life in that classroom was in heaven, literally. And he taught them stuff, and they learned stuff, and they were. Mm, they they cared deeply about him, and he cared deeply about them, and he would he would do anything for them. And and the strange thing about it, you know, you describe his uh, ultimate goal of going back to Sydney and playing a guitar in a bar. Um, it it all seems kind of trite compared with the experience he had in Lunana. Uh, why would he leave Lunana and go to a bar in Sydney and play the guitar for guys drinking beer? Really. What a mistake that was. <clears throat> and that's what I got out of it. It was a mistake. He, he made a profound error with his life. Uh, that young girl who uh, taught him how to sing, she taught him her special song. They sat and looked over this fantastic landscape, looking into the mountains. It was unbelievable. I mean, the, the camera work on this uh, and the, you know, the, the, the production values were extraordinary. And they sit together and they overlook uh, this mountain scenery and and they sing her special song. And uh, obviously she likes him and he likes her. And there's this moment when he's leaving again because he's driven to go back to Sydney, foolish boy. And, uh, <clears throat> you know, and um, they say farewell and you, you really wonder, well, you know, why are they saying farewell? They obviously like each other. She's very pretty, um, but, you know, she lives in a small mountain town in the middle of nowhere, and uh, I guess he just couldn't, he couldn't make peace with that. Well, but she's a, a major character in this, in this uh, movie. What's her name here? Uh, Keldon, the actress is Sheldon Lahamo Gurung, yeah. They're all, you know, she's a, a, a Bhutanese, uh, you know, I think she's an actress, yeah, but. Uh, you know, or she might be a local, you know, I, I didn't really, but the little girl is definitely a local. But, you know, one of the things she does tell him that she doesn't even want to live in, in the capital thing. Through. So if they're going to have a relationship, he's got to he's got to stay in that community. Right. That's what she was saying. And yeah. that's what he was entertaining. Maybe he never really committed to it. Um, yeah. But that's what that's what you as the member of the audience were entertaining. Maybe the guy would stay there because this was Shangri-La. This is as close as you get in the world today to right. we law heaven on earth. Exactly. This, this town where, you know, first of all, you have to start with Bhutan. Bhutan, they say, is the happiest place on earth. The people are happy. And you can see that in the movie, their relationships and their, you know, general attitude. They had, you know, no, no negatives at all. They all loved each other, the old and the young, the, you know, the girls and the boys, the parents, everybody. And it reminds me of a short story, which I'll take a moment and tell you. Sure. You know, there's uh, the Asia Pacific Center for Security Studies in Waikiki, and uh, they, they bring in people from all over Asia, and they, and they, they put them up in uh, hotel rooms uh, in, you know, Waikiki and everything. And, and uh, you know, the, the Chinese are... Um, they're fretful. They're hard to deal with. They're kind of retentive. Um, and the Bhutanese are fun. They make jokes. Uh, the Bhutanese are always happy. Uh, so I, I was really uh, amazed at what happens when you put a, a Chinese guy really stiff 
you know, trained in the army or whatever, okay, together with a Bhutanese guy, <laughs> and living in a small condo in Waikiki. Well, the Bhutanese guy was running the show. He was so funny, and and he and he's always making fun of the Chinese guy. <laughs> and the two of them got over the several weeks of this program, they got to be lifelong buddies. Uh, even though the Chinese guy didn't make friends very easily <laughs> because the Bhutanese guy was so much fun. And they are fun. And they're kind and gentle and honest and, you know, great, great culture, great culture. So, um, you know, I think that's a big part of it. And and he learns, our teacher, he learns that he, he mm, mm, immerses himself in that. He immerses himself in in the simple life, if you will. Where for paper he in the windows of his little of his little classroom in which he slept by the way lest we forget uh, were made out of some kind of parchment or something and 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 the, and the kids had no paper so he took the windows his own windows down and he gave them the the windows to use as paper that's an example of where we are on this exactly uh, and he you know he made he he, he actually created a, a blackboard out of wood. He had some of the elders in the village give him some wood, and and they painted it with mm, some black charcoal paint, and and he got some chalk, and now we have a blackboard. Um, so you know, all these things were so simple, so basic, so mm, what's the word? Fundamental human experience is what it was. And you know, I'm afraid I, I criticize the character because I don't think he understood. The, the fabulous experience that life had given him on top of the mountain with these kids and the young girl and the elders who who liked him a lot. Um, and it was, a, you know, to me, it was a big mistake that he left. But let me let me go to something else, why this movie is so interesting to me, why it was and increasingly is interesting to me. There was there was no war. There was no news of war. There was really no connection with the outside. They lived in exquisite peace and harmony every day. Um, they, you know, they were spending their time alive on the planet in a way that we should we should all envy, you know. Um, and um, I must say that it was a relief to get away from the news about uh, Russia's invasion of Ukraine, which we've talked about, and the uh, this horrible. Um, massacre in Israel and and uh, all all the trouble in the Middle East and uh, riots and crowds and the United States where our our democracy is frankly in my opinion falling apart. Um, they didn't have anything like that. This movie had nothing like that, and it was it was a relief to get away from that. I, I turned off cable news. This was much better than cable news. This was a tonic for your soul. This movie, yes, visibly. I mean, you you knew while you were watching the movie that this was a relief from the ordinary stress and strain of, you know, finding out what's going on in our perverse world these days. So that's why this movie teaches you something. And if you look at the reviews, they were really good reviews on this movie. Uh, it, it would have it would have gotten uh, an Oscar, except that the the government of Bhutan uh, had some bureaucratic problem and they handed it in late, <laughs> so it never got submitted on time. And that's why they didn't get her, you know, an Oscar. But <clears throat> but let me say though that um, this movie was different than anything else that you and I have reviewed. Um, this movie seemed at first pretty simple, um, but it wasn't simple. Uh, this movie seemed to, you know, you had to reach for a lesson, as you and I always do, uh, out of this movie. But after a while, you realize the lesson was right there. The reviewers all said that the the heart of the movie is that the simple life is best. But I think that's an understatement. I think that's it. It, it goes further than that. This is this is humanity at its best, and uh, you want to go there. Although I'm afraid I I. I don't think I can handle the altitude. The altitude of that uh, village was, uh, what, 11,000 feet, 3,500 meters. And, um, you know, it's probably tough to live there. Um, but everybody was happy there. 
But P.S., by the way, one of those school children, one of the actresses, the actress, those five or six year old school children who you love so much, uh, died uh, after the movie was made. It was made a couple of years ago, I think. Um, she died of leukemia, which is really sad because all those kids were so, so beautiful with wide eyed kids, like out of a keen yeah. painting, you know, wide eyed, willing to learn anything. Um, you know, sucking up knowledge from this young teacher, um, you know, finding everything that he had to offer. Um, so it's, it's yes, it's a simple movie. It teaches you simplicity. It teaches you that the simple life is better. But, it, you know, that's not a that's not a simple lesson. <laughs> it's, this movie teaches you way beyond that. And, and you say to yourself, gee, why can't the rest of the world be just like Lunana? You know, he, he had not gone to Australia previously because he had that pamphlet showing Australia that he, that he carried around with him. And, you know, a lot of young people, I have local friends here in Hawaii that at a young age, in their 20s, they they're born and raised here. They go up and they go to Vegas, they go to California, they go to the mainland. Um, sometimes they get stuck over there for school or for a job, but then they always realize that the end of the rainbow, it's not so perfect over there on the mainland. And they come back, right? And and maybe get a, a lesser job, you know? Like, like, I left my great job in, on the mainland, and I'm not even a local person. I'm from, you know, East Coast originally. But, and then came here, you know, and, and because with even with the economic negatives, you know, here, it's a very, it's a more peaceful, it's like a, in Hawaiian, I forgot. It's like a sanctuary about against the craziness in the world. And this Lunana was like a sanctuary. But at the end of the movie, as you alluded to, he sort of has a change of heart. And you can talk about this too, because he's in that bar and he's singing and nobody's looking at him. They're drinking, they're talking to their friends and he's singing his heart out, right? They don't even look at him. So all of a sudden he stops, right? And you know, he stops singing, right? And he starts to think for a minute. And the, the owner says, hey, again, you know, uh, you sp I pay you to sing, right? Sing. And he starts to sing the song that that young woman, uh, Seldon, taught him up in the hills about the yaks and their life up there, right? So it's sort of like he's having a change of heart, you know, after, go after getting his dream was to go to, Australia, right? And, and then he comes, uh, to, goes to Australia and then sort of has a change in heart. Maybe that was a better because those kids were totally dedicated toward him. They're looking at him. They, they're counting on him. And these people in the bar don't even know he exists, you know? It's background music. So that that's pretty much the profound lesson. And that's how the movie ends. Sort of leaves you hanging. Is he just, Does he decide to go back the next? Because during the winter, there's no school up there anyhow. So maybe he decides to go back, you know, because he was, he was needed. He was loved, you know, and in, us, and, and in Sydney, Australia, ignoring him, you know, not to say that eventually he may make a success because he was a really good singer. So you could add to that a little, Jay, and, and you're filling up, you've already filled in a lot, but. You no, know, that was very touching, you know, when he was playing, I don't know, bar music um, with his guitar and he was okay. It was good. I mean, I don't think he was, a brilliant musician. He was more a brilliant teacher, actually. Um, and so uh, when, when the, uh, the proprietor tells him, keep, keep singing, and he sings the mountain song, um, it's very touching. It's an emotional moment at the end of that movie. Yes. And it brings the whole thing uh, into focus. You know, what is it really about for him? And I guess I would ask you, you know, living in that world, the world of that character, the world of that village, the world of that school schoolhouse, um, did he go back? Would he go back? Do you think he did go back as a, you know, and, and this is not a true movie, but it's taken from stories that people have brought out of Bhutan. So it's a it's a true environment is what it is. And, and his relationship with it was well portrayed. But I would say that that moment in the bar was a critical moment for him. Um, and I think maybe the realization came to him that the simple life on top of the mountain with the music and the, with the music and the young woman and the kids and all that, 
uh, were the best thing he could do in life. The problem is you don't recognize that when you're young, <clears throat> right? It's those kids that go to Las Vegas. They're in for a thrill. Um, when you're a little older, maybe you recognize it and you appreciate it. And maybe maybe he was going through that kind of transition. And the and the bar and the people in the bar the proprietors and all that were, you know, um, teaching him something. But you know, the, the 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 movie doesn't move that fast. You have to watch for the detail. It's almost like it gets by you. It, you know, you don't you don't spot these critical things that happen. These lessons that that he learns and the children learn and and how life is in this very simple world. And you say, hmm, I think I have to go back and look at it again. I have to immerse myself in this simple world. It's almost, as I said, it's almost like you become part of it. It's a keyhole into this little village. And you, you're with him. You are him. He, you relate to this character. You say, hmm, I could do that. I'd like to do that. I, li I like to be surrounded with these beautiful, beautiful children. Um, I'd like to have them admire me the way these children admired him. And so um, it's the simplicity that's so captivating. Precisely. Really, really amazing. A, a, sort of an emotional thing, Ty, you know, you, you get emotionally tied to the children, you get emotionally tied to the whole circumstance of him teaching up there and, and that symbi symbiotic relationship he has with the kids, right? And then the keeps coming to my mind the symbiotic relationship they had with nature, you know? That, I mean, to, to survive up there, you've got to be in, in tune with the natural environment, you know? That's the way our ancestors lived millennia ago, you know, with the natural environment before we had technology, you know, or or farming, you know, basic farming. So it's just, it's, it's just, it really hit me like you, like it did you emotionally, this, this movie was, you know, because I'm also trained as a school teacher, you know, master's in history education. I'm not, why am I not surprised? Yeah, I'm, <laughs> but I'm, I'm, let, let, me, let me say this, George. This is really interesting. In the reviews I read, one of them talked about um, something that you and I have not discussed here yet. And, and that is that um, how can this, this beautiful life, this, this, this pearl, this, this gem at the top of the mountains, continue in a world of chaos, you know, in every direction around, you know. I mean, right now, the Chinese are fighting with the um, the Indians uh, in the Himalayas, you know, and we hear news about that every every few months uh, about this in uh, this this uh, diffused border they have at the top of the mountains. And, and so, uh, you know, the world is in chaos in so many ways, so much hot spots, so much violence. So much irrationality, so much craziness, you know, and, and a lack of caring about your fellow human beings. It's awful what's happening. I, and I'm sorry that we have this, but we have it. So here's this mountaintop place where these people are like angels, you know. They're completely unspoiled. And in the review, and I didn't see this in the movie, and maybe it wasn't in the movie, but there was a comment about a cell phone tower, a cell phone tower, that they were building a cell phone tower near this village. And now all of a sudden things were going to change. Now there were gonna be cell phones and now they're gonna be in touch with the world. And they could, you know, I mean, it's good if somebody gets sick, you know, you call, call for help, whatnot. Um, if there's some problem in the village, you know, call for help. and and talk to your family and friends elsewhere, whatnot, get the news, I mean, all of that. But the cell phone tower is an intrusion, you know, into the the paradise of this village. Yeah. And uh, so that's, we should cover that, George, because this is um, like Shangri-La, ephemeral. There is this huge threat of a world gone mad and not too far away. This huge threat of these people in their in their paradise losing their paradise. It's coming soon. So you cannot assume, and maybe he knew this, maybe the teacher knew this. You cannot assume it was going to stay like this. Rather, you have to assume that there will be an, an incursion of technology 
a, you know, a more, a more uh, uncaring society coming from Bhutan or Tibet or India or any of the countries around there, uh, coming from business, coming from government, coming from the military. You know, China is right there. And uh, maybe China has plans on Bhutan the way it has plans on everything. So <clears throat> yeah, I think we have to factor that in, don't you? Oh, yeah. And uh, Asha, the, the village leader, he was talking about that these kids should not be only yak, yak herders and mushroom. I forgot some kind of mushroom uh, gatherers, that they should have the ability to do other things in the world. And that basically means that they're going to leave this pristine village and go to the capital or go somewhere else in the world. So even the village leaders encouraging, you know, change. And with this cell phone tower, as you alluded to, it's going to change everything. It's going to, and then that that way of life up there is going to change, you know. just I've been here like on and off 30 years and Hawaii is completely different. We had all the little mom and pop stores, you had, everything. You got the big box now. The world with with internet is totally different today, you know. But we're in, instantly in touch with all the tr troubles of the world, which to have to be on our shoulders, you know. What's going on? We see all this gore and horrible things going on. People getting killed, throats slit, whatever. That we never really had that kind of instant, you know, thing before that we can see. So yes, what you're saying. Their way of life is changing the minute that, you know, just like in the in the Brazilian um, Amazon, right? Those those people, uh, as civilization comes, changes everything. So so um, very profound movie. I mean, I, I would say that I I should watch this a few more times because it really hit home. As you said, it really was emotionally to me. It really hit home. Well, there's a certain sadness in it when you realize that these kids, you know, they're going to grow up. What are they growing up into? They're growing up into the destruction of their culture. Uh, they're growing up into being, you know, having to leave the uh, the um, the mountaintop community. You cannot imagine it lasting all that long. And that's why the movie is, um, it is, it's Proustian. Because you look through the keyhole and you see it in great detail, great cinematography. <clears throat> you see the way people live. You have a, it's, it's, it, you see their daily lives. You see, these are real people. They're not actors. They're not actors. <laughs> it's real people. And, and this is the way they live. This is their village. And so you say, I, I have the, you know, the advantage of looking in through into the keyhole and seeing it as it exists today. It may not exist that much longer, but it's a joy to, to see it and see the way they are today. And that's why the movie is, is so touching. So what are we now? Yeah, we're near the end. We have to rate this, Jay, because it's like you know, it's time to rate. I give this a 10 plus, you know, it, and this, the director, producer, they really understood that village because they're from Bhutan, you know, and 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 the, his name is also Dorji, just like the main actor, Shirab Dorji, last name, the, the, the producer, director is also Dorji, his last name. And he understands all this. So he presented this so realistically uh, from an ins as an insider. So as you said, the, the filming is beautiful. And, you know, they had a lot of troubles. They, they If it doesn't rain, it snows. So they had to play with with generators and stuff to film this. This was not an easy movie to film. So it was really difficult for them to do that because at times they had difficulty even with sun or, or you know lighting and whatever. So really good. Everything, production value, scenery, acting, even though some of it was just natural, was great. And, and Shirab Dorji, the main actor, was he's a sort of a, actor and a singer, you know, but and he's Bhutanese. Yeah, he's Bhutanese. He's a, he's a local. Yeah. So I'll give it a 10 plus. So I'll leave it to you, Jay, to, to give your rating. Yeah, I, I would also give it a 10 plus. I really, I love this movie. I want more of it, but I know that there'll be less of it going forward. Um, I, I like movies that are international, 
but I love movies that show me things and teach me things that I had no idea about. Um, and you, I give you credit for being able to pronounce their names. Um, those names, you know, of the people, uh, the names in the movie, completely unpronounceable. Uh, and and what's what I found interesting is that, um, you know, Bhutan is made of villages like this. Um, they speak in Bhutan 22 languages, 22. They're, you know, in one village, then another village and so forth. Uh, it's really a study for a linguist. And it includes, uh, you know, to, roots of Tibetan and um, Nepalese and uh, Chinese and Indian. I mean, they're sort of you know, anybody in the Himalayas has, has got all these influences and, and that has influenced their language. But I, I, I don't think I could ever learn the language that they were speaking in this movie. Well, I'm good some, news for you that you can pronounce the names. Sometime I'll explain to you my own eth ethnicity history with China influence, Himalayan, Indian influence, intermarriage, that nobody knows, you know. There's a lot of Silk Road stuff that sort of gotten lost in the, in the what do they call the somethings of time, you know, annals of time over the, over the, minute, over the centuries and millennia. That I will get into that sometime. It's really okay, but but not. We're not going to do that now because no, we're out of time. Not now. And, and I, uh, I really enjoyed hearing your, uh, you know, summary of this and your comments about it, George. And Same I think that it it does really reflect the two of us. We uh, we have the sensibility to appreciate this movie and to, and to see it for a little piece of Shangri La. Thank yes. you so much. Thank you, George your Kaysen. Sentiment. Your sentiments too, Jay really were profound. Thank you as well. Thank you. Movies you can learn from here on ThinkTech. Aloha.